There are some places in the world that are so packed with history that it's nearly impossible to cover all of it in one go, and certainly not within one podcast episode. The country we're visiting today is one of those places. Across the pond, Spain is one of the first countries to establish itself after the fall of the Roman Empire and remains a mecca for tradition and culture to this day. That's not even the beginning to delve into their fantastic cuisine. So join me today as we take a trip to the land of matadors, flamingo dancers, and the kind of football that you actually play with your feet. I'm Scott Parrish, and you're listening to Dying to Eat, the podcast that delves into different cultures of the world throughout time, exploring the different attitudes about death and food. If you love history, good eating, and fascinating stories, then I have a great show in store for you, so make sure you stick around to the end to see what's cooking this week. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, TheTailoredHemp.com. If you need high-quality CBD, please visit them online at TheTailoredHemp.com. Now on with the show. Spain has a lot to boast about. It's bordered to the west by Portugal, to the north by France, and if you want to take a short nine-mile swim to the south, you'll end up in the African country of Morocco. Many different kinds of people live in this region over centuries and including, but not limited to, the Iberians, the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Visigoths, Celts, the Basque, and the Moors. Man, that's a lot of people. All of who were Muslims and they came from Africa. The Basque were the ones, one of the oldest, if not the oldest people in Europe, and they were great warriors that never fully came under control of the Romans. The Moors established the first university in Spain, and the Phoenicians gave the land its name. There have been so many different kinds of rulers in Spain throughout history that I'm not even sure if if they've even lost count. Every culture that came to Spain left their mark. There's a wealth of history and culture everywhere you look. Working Roman aqueducts can still be found in Spanish countryside, and the same ports that the Greeks used in ancient times for sea trade are still there today. If you want to go back even further, here's a fun fact for you. During the last ice age, most of Europe was covered by glaciers, but Spain was far enough south to escape the ice. Interesting, huh? Consequently, plants that were wiped out across Europe survived in Spain. Europe as a whole has 9,000 plant species. There are over 8,000 plant species in Spain alone, with 2,000 of them being unique just to that country. It's a beautiful place, with a diverse spread of people that matches fauna. In fact, I just came back from a trip from Spain. When I got back, producer Pete, he asked me, he goes, how was your, how was your trip? I had to tell him, it was Spainful. Dad joke done. So some of the greatest artists have also come from Spain. Artists such as Pablo Picasso and Salvador Dali. Another fun fact, the mop was invented in Spain by a Spanish inventor, by, and his name was Manuel Ormancor Alinas. I could literally go on and on about the wonders of Spain and all the country has to offer. They've had a long time to work on things. Even before recorded history, the region of Spain was busy with the activity of early man. Human fossils and ancient tools in Spain, found by researchers, belong to Homo sapiens, the Neanderthals, and even earlier members of the human lineage. The oldest known cave painting in the world is found in the Cave de Caso in northern Spain. There, researchers have found a faint red dot that was thought to be over 40,000 years old. Artistry was practically invented in Spain, which should honestly be no surprise to anyone. Fast forward a few millennia, after the Phoenicians, the Greeks, and even the Romans, and many of the other visitors that Spain had, we'll slow down for a minute, in the 6th century. The Roman Empire was coming to an end of their downfall, and the Germanic tribes began making their way into Spain. One such group was known as the Viscos, the people that originally lived along the Dubonnet River. They caused a lot of trouble for the declining Romans, and essentially kept them from expanding further into Spain than they had already had. Despite the collapse of imperial rule in Spain, Roman influence remained strong. Many Spanish Romans still lived in the area and were devout Roman Catholics. 
While the Goths and the Romans did share a lot of their culture with each other, religion was definitely not one of them. Although the Visigoths were Christian, they held to the Arian belief, mostly just to stick it to the Roman Catholic Church. This all changed in 587 when the Visigoth king, Ricard, was converted to Catholicism and the rest of the Goths were soon to follow. The Visigoth fought against the Byzantine Empire to the east and against the Franks to the north at the same time from 477 to 624. And though the Goth were pushed out of Gaul, they did manage to expand their hold to the rest of the Iberian Peninsula by 624, which was essentially modern-day Spain as we know it now. But a new kind of invasion was rising to the east. With the birth of Islam, the Moors crossed the Strait of Gibraltar to Morocco and swiftly defeated the fractured Biscoth kingdom. This was not destined to last, however, because in the 9th century, an extremely long process called the Requista began, a war that was between the Spanish Christians and the Muslims in order to drive them out of Spain. The Islamic states of Spain also shot themselves in the foot when this happened, when they declared this massive kill order to convert or die that resulted in a mass exodus of Jews and Christians from their lands and into the hands of their enemies. By 1250, Spain had become a Christian, flopped over to Muslim, and then was back to Christianity again. Man, I'm getting whiplash just from, just from going over this history. It's kind of like watching a tennis match. By now, Spain had two main powerhouse kingdoms, Castile and Aragon. These lands would eventually unite to become the Kingdom of Spain. But before they did, there was one major event that happened that would go down in history. And that was the creation of the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Our younger listeners probably won't get the reference, and all I have to say about that is that you're missing out. After this podcast, go look up Monty Python. I'm sure your, their skits are somewhere on YouTube, and man, you'll be glad you did. It's something that my friends and I still joke about. They did a pretty good job with a piece on the Spanish Inquisition, though I'm afraid in the real thing, it wasn't near as funny, and Mel Brooks, he, he did a great job. And I'm glad he did, but there's a lot more to delve into. There had been inquisitions before Spain had made their own, and there were other institutions like the Inquisition after they had gone. The Spanish Inquisition stands out in history for two major reasons, one of them being their methods, and the other for how long they lasted. To understand the tyranny and terror of the Spanish Inquisition, we need to understand why they were created in 1478. There are several theories of how they came to be, and I'm just going to give a brief summary of each. One hypothesis. That's the two multi-religious hypothesis. Basically, what we're saying is the Spanish Inquisition was made specifically to unite Spain under the Catholic Church, which at the time in the 15th century was still inhabited by Christians, Jews, and Muslims alike. Then there's the enforcement across the borders hypothesis, which is similar to the first, but with less God in the picture. It, 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 there was Castile in the west and Aragon in the east. Each had their own separate monarch. The Inquisition was meant to be an institution that the two rulers could share without actually uniting their kingdoms. That wouldn't happen until 1479, a year later when Queen Isabella married King Ferdinand. Then there's the Placate Europe hypothesis which states that the Inquisition wasn't just for Spain, but it was for the sake of all Europe. Since Spain had Jews and Moors in their country, people had been driven out of the rest of Europe. Spain had a little bit of a tarnished reputation as the only multicultural, multi-religious country at that time. The Inquisition was meant to help with that and establish a stronger connection with its neighbors. Who knew that Spain was so conscientious about their image? Now, the Ottoman scare hypothesis believes that the Inquisition was meant to bolster Spain's power against the growing empire in Africa. Then there's my personal favorite, my personal favorite, excuse me, the keep the Pope in check hypothesis. These are always interesting. 
This hypothesis is based solely on the idea that the Inquisition was made so that the Pope over in Rome would stop meddling in the Spanish affairs and just leave them alone. I like to think that the Pope, as Spain's nosy neighbor, judging how well they cut their lawn and go through their mail, <laughs> whichever theory makes the most sense to you, I like to think that maybe it was actually just a little bit of all of it. So, the Spanish Inquisition came to be, and initially it wasn't very big. King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella selected two or three priests, one of, one of which was a Dominican monk named Thomas de, I'm going to try his last name here, Torquemada. He started as the Inquisition's president, and as the power grew, he eventually gained the title of Inquisitor General. At first, the Inquisition was this peaceful movement in Spain. It liberated Christians who had been falsely accused of heresy and converted some of the minor religions over to Catholicism. Their numbers grew, and soon they were traveling inquisitors all over Spain and even venturing into the rest of Europe to spread the word of God. So the Inquisition also managed to get a great foothold in the Americas, where Spain was beginning to expand their empire. You know, everybody wanted a piece of that, right? But things didn't stay that way for very long. This period of history is especially bloody, even by European standards which started off as a movement to unify people, soon it turned into this mass institution of fear and pain. Instead of converting people to Christianity, the Inquisition started to mercilessly, mercilessly torture men and women who were already believed to be Christians in order to prove that they were faithful. Those that were unable to do so were deemed as heretics and they were put to death. Eventually, all the remaining Jews and Moors had to make this difficult choice. Either they had to flee from Spain or convert and risk facing the wrath of the Inquisition. Man, what a way to live. So, as you can imagine, many just, they just left. I mean, that's not much of a choice, right? For those that stayed, there was an increased risk of getting caught by the Inquisition. Even if they truly did convert, it was extremely likely that they would be accused of false conversion. That meant that they were daylighting as Catholics and still practicing their own religions in secret. The Inquisition also dealt with men and women who had been accused of witchcraft and those that were found guilty were burned at the stake. Does that sound familiar in American history? Kind of creepy, I know. So basically, anything that wasn't strictly Catholic was deemed as heresy and was therefore grounds for death. Wow, man, that's just tough. And that meant no orthodox beliefs, that meant no questioning your faith, and that meant no drinking or premarital pleasures. Even the Freemasons weren't safe. And within the first 100 years of the Inquisition's establishment, over 500 people were killed. And they were just the beginning of this whole ordeal. But what actually made, what actually made the Spanish Inquisition so horrible, well... Let's see if I can lay it out for you without getting into too much detail. The Inquisitors were specially trained priests who were instructed in the art of discover, discovering heresy and rooting it out. They specialized in extracting penance and confessions from the heretics. Almost always, they did this through torture. Those accused of heresy were punished. The lucky ones would simply be locked in a cell and forgotten about, sometimes for years at a time until they just died of malnutrition or were killed quickly in order to make more room for new heretics. Most people were just not that lucky. The punishments were usually made to match the level of heresy that the person had supposedly committed. Some were sent to forced pilgrimage to holy cities, while others were severely whipped and scarred for life. For the Inquisitors, true penance could only be achieved through deep pain. These guys sound like a real party downer, I know. And if you ask me, it, it was just craziness. But people get caught up in that. We see it all throughout history. This was some of the lighter punishments because those are the people that confessed. Those people that didn't confess, now they were really in a world of pain. It didn't help that most of those that were accused had done so, they had done nothing, and they were falsely accused by their neighbors in a show of petty re, uh, revenge or maybe jealousy or something along that line. 
Once an accusation was made, little evidence was needed to reach a guilty verdict. And imagine the Salem witch trials, because this is what it sounds a lot like to me. Uh, it was just on a much larger scale. One of the preferred methods of getting a confession was called strapadado, where the hands were tied behind the back and the ropes were attached to a pulley that would lift them into the air. Man, my back's hurting just thinking about it, so I can't imagine what it must have really been like. Uh, another popular tool was the rack, and you may know a little bit about this. It was that famous stretching board along with the infamous Iron Maiden. What I find funny is that mutilation was forbidden by the church. I know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But the Pope gave the Inquisitors the power to forgive each other for any wrongdoings committed during their sessions. I won't go into a lot more detail about what was going on during those trials, but trust me when I say that, man, it was bad. It was really bad. And it's not like the Inquisitors themselves were entirely free of sin either. Diego Rodriguez Lucero, an inquisitor that would later be known as the Bringer of Darkness, operated from 1499 to 1506 and routinely used the power of his position for self-gain. He once sent a young man to burn at a stake so that he could take his wife for himself. In 1506, he handed out over a hundred death sentences in one year. Lucero was eventually arrested for his corruption by the Grand Inquisitor, but the Roman Catholic Church calling Lucero corrupt is kind of like the pot calling the kettle black, as far as I'm concerned. I wish I could say Lucero was the only one to abuse his power, but that would be a blatant lie. The basic idea of what I want to get across is that the Spanish Inquisition was one of the darkest periods in European history. It was a time of legalized horror inflicted upon the religious minorities. This went on for close to 400 years. And by the time the Inquisition was abolished on July 15, 1834, over 150,000 people had been accused, and of those that were accused, between 3,000 and 5,000 had been executed. All right. Let's take a break from talking about the Inquisition. Instead, switch our attention to something that is a, a different kind of conquest in Spain. Uh, I'm talking about the Spanish Navy, of course, which, if you're not familiar with, I'm happy to tell you about. At the height of the Spanish Empire, it was the most powerful and successful naval force in the known world. Many Spanish explorers set out into the world starting in the 13th century. We all know about King Ferdinand funding Christopher Columbus's voyage to for, in 1492. Remember, Christopher Columbus sailed the seas in 1492. That's how I remember it from from junior high. And as we all know, Columbus got hopelessly lost and eventually discovered the Americas. But can you really say that he discovered America when the Vikings had already been here and there were already people living here? Now, that's a, that's a discussion for another time, but I'm going to let you think about that. Either way, Columbus's mistake made Spain the most powerful country in the world as they began to expand their empire from Cuba to California, from Peru into Mexico. Aside from Columbus, there were plenty of other explorers who had set out into the world, sparking the Age of Discovery. Spain was the leader when it came to sea exploration, followed closely by their neighbors, the Portuguese. Many things were discovered and learned about the world at this time, and a lot of, let's call them first, were happening too. In 1603, Spanish sailor Gabriel de uh, Castilla became the first man to ever see, the, ever see Antarctica. Spanish explorer Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo discovered California. Juan Sebastian Oconico, excuse me, Juan Sebastian Ocano was the first man to circumnavigate the world with his Portuguese partner, partner, and you may know this name, Fernand Magellan. Vasco Nunez de Balboa was the first European to see the Pacific Ocean after hearing about the Ocean of Gold. The blank spaces on the map were beginning to fill in, and the world was becoming smaller. With new lands required new innovations. Another thing that the Spanish really excelled at. For example, 
Spanish sailor and engineer Isaac Perel designed the first fully operative military submarine. In 1538, the diving bell was invented in Spain, which was a bell-shaped device made of leather and metal and was lowered over a person, trapping the air within, even as it was submerged underwater. Spanish conquistadors were making their way through South and Central America, and we all know how that turned out. We've talked about it on other episodes, and I'm sure we'll talk about it again. With every voyage and discovery, the Spanish Empire grew larger and larger, more and more powerful. Keep in mind, this was also the age of pirates, and there were um, a, a lot of popularity and a lot of, how do I want to say it, romanticism around, around that whole issue as well. Spanish pirates, or what we know as buccaneers, were famous for harassing Spanish ships, particularly the galleon ships that carried enormous amounts of gold, silver, and other, other valuables. England, France, and many other European nations also had their interest in the wealth of the Caribbean islands and the American continents. However, Spain strived to keep her possessions from the rest of the world by any means possible. England and Spain were major rivals at the time. So when English occupied Jamaica, providing a base for the buccaneers to launch their attacks on Spanish settlements, the conflict inflated, as did the rise of the buccaneers. But they also did so at their own risk, as these same ships were often loaded to the gills with cannons and other artillery to drive off unwanted visitors. To the Spanish, the buccaneers were just like every other pirate, and mostly sailed the seas undeterred. Only the most rash of the pirates were ever brave enough, or foolish enough maybe, to attack the Spanish ships. The Spanish considered the region of the Caribbean islands, from the Isthmus of Panama to the mouth of the Orinoco River, as their own treasure house. That region is also known as the Spanish Main. It was the point of departure for these enormously wealthy expeditions from the 16th to the 18th century. After the Spanish Empire began to decline in power in the late 17th century, the English and French moved to take their place. Spain quickly started losing their territories and colonies over the years to come, leaving them what we know today as modern Spain. Since then, Spain has continued to grow and struggle. Constant warfare and piracy took their toll on Spain, and they lost their lead in the race for the European dominance of France, to France, England, and Russia. Spain was even ruled by France for a short period of time, leading into the uh, Napoleonic Wars in the 19th century. A Spanish king wouldn't return to the throne until 1813. This led to a turbulent time in Spain with revolutions and counter-revolutions for the next half century. In 1873, a monarchy was abolished, the monarchy was abolished, and the first Spanish Republic was founded. But with the Spanish-American War and the Cuban War in the late 1800s, Spain became a shell of the empire it had once been, and it lost all of its belongings in the American and the Philippines. With the outbreak of World War I, Spain declared neutrality and experienced an economic boom, stifled only by the Spanish flu and insurrections in Morocco. In 1936, Spain had come to their own civil war, and due to the lack of stability between the Nationalists and the Republicans, uh, it, it was a horrible war. It was because of this that Spain also had to declare neutrality during World War II. The monarchy came back to Spain for a short period of time in 1975, but it was quickly abandoned for the constitutional monarchy instead. When Spain joined the European Union in 1986, the decision to do so ended up helping to stabilize the economy and industry, something the country needed for a very long time. Today, Spain is one of the most visited countries in Europe alongside France. Millions of people travel to Spain each year to experience the, device, the diverse culture and deeply rooted history spanning across several nations and time periods. It's a country that's held on for a really long time. Sometimes, it seems like by the tip of its fingers.
They remain an important political entity in the Western Europe, working hard for industrial growth and slowly healing from the wounds of its recent history. Man, it's just a, a really tough way for that country to go. It, it had a turbulent, turbulent history. So, I've already talked about the Spanish Inquisition, which should pretty much cover the death portion of our episode. But I wanted to give a shout out to a different kind of ceremony that I stumbled on in my research. It's called the, and bear with me here, the Fiesta de Santa Maria de Ratimi, known to foreigners like you and me as the Festival of Near Death Experiences. As its name suggests, it's a celebration for those people who have had near death experience and live to tell the tale. St. Marta de Ratimi, as it turns out, is the patron saint of resurrection. It's held in a small Spanish village that borders Portugal, Las Navera, Pantrevedra, and Glassa, and happens on the 29th of July. Thousands of people line the streets of this tiny village. At 10 a.m., the relatives of the people who narrowly, narrowly escaped death are expected to carry their loved ones in coffins to the small church. There is a shrine of the Virgin Santa Maria, Santa Marta. After Mass, which is projected across the village using loudspeakers, the procession then walks to the local cemetery and then back to the church with a large statue of the Virgin Santa Marta overseeing the celebrations. Through the festival, it's centered around this pretty morbid theme, but they tend to still have this really lively celebration that includes fireworks displays, and there's usually a big party that's carried on within uh, the next day or so. With this unique way to celebrate life and death, I can imagine that folks at these festivals have some pretty amazing stories to tell and probably know how to make some pretty delicious food. I would expect I would be. And speaking of food, let me send you guys off with this recipe for this episode. Spain has lots of delicious cuisine. So it was really hard for me to narrow down exactly what we're going to eat this week. Nearly three quarters of the world's saffron is grown in Spain. There is the style of eating that's called tapas, the bite-sized version of large dishes that we enjoy for snacks. Along with being one of the more diverse winemakers in the world, Spain also seems to enjoy a lot of Scotch whiskey. But there's one dish that really stood out ab uh, above all the rest, paella. Paella is a very fun Spanish dish that brings natives and foreigners together alike. It's mainly like a rice dish, and it's mostly popular served with fish, but it can be any protein. It, it doesn't matter. You choose your, you choose your protein. In this particular recipe, we'll be adding chorizo, which is a Spanish spiced pork. You're going to want to start with your own chorizo cut in half, one inch rounds, and toss it into a skillet with a little bit of olive oil over medium heat. By the way, did you guys know that Spain is actually the biggest olive oil manufacturer? And here I was all the time thinking it was Italy, but hey, we learn something every week on this show, right? So, brown the chorizo in the skillet, and while that's cooking, dice up a small onion, three cloves of garlic, and a red and a yellow bell pepper. Add those to your skillet. Cook until the onion's translucent. Next, you're going to add more spice with a teaspoon of paprika, two tablespoons of parsley, and a pinch of saffron mixed with an ounce of water. It, you know, if you happen to have it. You don't have to have the saffron, but I fully think that it adds a, a little bit more depth. And I know saffron can get a little pricey, so, you know, you choose what's good for you. The recipe calls for all these specific quantities, but I say measure with your heart. Give that stir and then pour some white wine into the same skillet and reduce for 10 minutes. Give that a quick taste and then add a little salt and pepper to your liking. In a different pot, take two chicken thighs cut into bite-sized pieces, one and a half cups of Spanish rice, and cook those together for about a minute. Afterwards, add three cups of chicken broth. Make sure you give that pot a little shake to get the rice into this even layer. Leave that alone to cook at a boil for uh, 15 to 18 minutes. And when I say leave it alone, I mean really leave it alone. 
you want a nice crust to form on the rice at the bottom. Once the liquid's been reduced, nestle some deveined shrimp, mussels, and scallops into the mixture and sprinkle 16 ounces of green peas on the top and continue to cook for about five more minutes. Watch for most of the liquid to be absorbed and the rice at the top to be nearly tender. If for some reason your rice is still not cooked, add a fourth cup more water or broth and continue cooking. Once it's done, you're going to add four diced tomatoes to the top and turn off the heat. Now let it sit and cover the pot with a lid or, you know, tin foil or whatever you have and remove it from the heat and let it rest for 15 minutes. Now you're ready to eat. Add that chorizo that you made before to your heart's content and just dig in. If you're a vegetarian now, this option works just as well without uh, any other proteins. You add what you want. It's definitely moldable to what your tastes are. I'm your host, Scott Parrish, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Dying to Eat. I really hope you enjoyed this episode in learning about the deep, turbulent history and the great country of Spain. This show is made possible by listeners like you. I'd like to give a special shout out to Adriana Williams of Nashville and Wes Morgan's Music. Your support drives the show and we really enjoy hearing from you. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you like, let us know what topics you want to hear in the future. You can find our past episodes on your favorite podcast platform. Give us a five-star rating, and don't forget to hit that like button to follow us and stay updated on future episodes. Until next time, stay lively.